I am really honored to be here. Um, I am familiar with this group. I was saying I used to go up to Thornhill They're at a library. They used to hold these meetings um, when, and I think it was, yeah, like 23 years ago. Um, so I decided to present on something different today, which is mindfulness. Um, and I want to just um, really speak about um, mindfulness because I feel like mindfulness, uh, among other things, is a way for us to really inhabit our lives after a diagnosis of cancer and in particular multiple myeloma. I've been uh, associated um, with Princess Margaret um, for 30 years now and I um, I have to say, when I began working at Princess Margaret, the upside of my experience with multiple myeloma was that I shared an assistant with Dr. Bernie, uh, Dr. Danny Bursigel. I don't know if you know that name, but he was the originator of treatment for multiple myeloma in the world. Um, and uh, the way I came to um, share an assistant with him was I was the only psychiatrist working at Princess Margaret 30 years ago and there was no department of psychiatry and they're like we don't know where to put you so Danny was on his way to retiring and so winding down a little bit and so um, I had the good fortune of um, having the expertise of Lynn Taylor his assistant to help me settle into the hospital um, unfortunately, at that time, the prognosis for multiple myeloma was less than a year. And so I just feel like it's one of those illnesses where um, support has always been necessary, good symptom management has always been really necessary, but the work on advocacy, when I hear you talk about the walks, I see the difference that the walks make. I see the difference that um, the fundraising has made. I see the difference that advocating um, for drug coverage has made. I recently um, gave a talk at a conference which I didn't even know existed. and. A maybe five, six years ago didn't exist, but it was for the Ontario Association of Drug Reimbursement Specialists, which is now working on your behalf, on all of our behalves, to really try and negotiate drug coverage for every single patient. So I was really honored to get to be um, their pre-conference speaker. Um, so, Today I'm going to talk about uh, in, inhabiting life after a diagnosis of cancer, how can mindfulness interventions help. And um, I was cleaning up, I, my office moved, my office has moved many times at Princess Margaret, not only buildings but also uh, different offices. And in one of the moves I found a clipboard and there was this picture which my daughter must have drawn when she was like waiting for me in my office one day. And um, so I use this to introduce a little exercise that um, is called rebounding joy. And so I would like, um, hmm, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna take the time. Name one thing that brings joy in your life, just really quickly, and we're just gonna go through the room. Anything. Hiking in the mountains. Great. My Helping others. Helping others. Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> Vocal history. Vocal history? Local history. Local history. Art. Art. Music. 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 Beer. 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 Pardon? Beer. The dog. The dog. Skiing. Skiing. Kitty cats. Grandchildren. Grandchildren. Giving back to the system. Giving back to the system. Skiing. Skiing. 
Spring weather. Spring weather. <laughs> 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 An optimist in the crowd. <laughs> Anyone else? Trees. Trees, gardening. Babies. Babies. Birds. Birds. Nature. 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 Trees. I, sorry, I missed that. Grandchildren. Grandchildren. Sorry. Music. Music. Children. 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 Sorry. Fishing. Being able to help in the world. Anyone else? Cottage. What's that? Cottage. Sunsets, Traveling. traveling, gardening, gardening. Grandchildren. grandchildren, Bruce or Veronica, My daughter. your daughter, anyone else? Family. Family. Anyone else? Oh, a hockey? <laughs> a really good hockey? <laughs> Winning hockey? <laughs> Shows. Sports and exercise. Sports and exercise. Yes. Friends. Friends. I'm going to say the stars. Um, so, um, which, what did you notice in the room as people named things that made them, brought joy in their life? Just call it out. Smiles. Louder voices. Louder voices. Upbeat. And bodies lifted up, right? A whole embodiment of it. Yes. What else? Um, some upbeat. Lucky. Gratitude came with it. Yeah. Sense of connection, right? As somebody was like, somebody said dogs. I'm like, oh, my dog. I love my dog. <laughs> you know, most of the time. Um, you know, so really important just touch into um what's your mood like after doing that exercise you know we said up be up our bodies energized light our thoughts what happens to your thoughts sharper sharper yeah yeah we've got more energy and there's also this, you know, so there's this beautiful sense that it's mindfulness isn't just about seeing what's wrong. It's also about making space for what's right. When we inhabit the present moment, sometimes we can be quite delighted to find that there's something available to us that's right here now, that if we're not so busy focused on the future, that we can be with what's here now and it can be a bit of joy. Um, that said, anyone who's taken a mindfulness program with me knows that I'm kind of a mother hen and I like things to go really well and I like things to be really well organized and I was up at Camp Ooch um, in the fall giving a, a keynote address to, for pediatric, adult survivors of pediatric cancer and I was deciding on sort of the theme and wanted to tie it all together and make it really nice. And I decided I wanted this, this sense of emerging like butterflies. So I went out for a walk. I said to my husband who had come with me, you know, I just want to go and just collect my thoughts. Um, and he said, have fun collecting your thoughts, see what you find along the way. And I sort of thought, Mm, you know, I'm going to use this butterfly theme and because I kept seeing these monarch butterflies and I saw this gorgeous monarch and I thought I'm going to take a picture of it. But of course, by the time I got my camera out, I got a beautiful picture of a hydrangea plant, no butterfly. <laughs> and so I kept looking for an hour. I was walking, trying to find a butterfly to take a picture of and I'd see them go by couldn't capture a picture. They too fast, or by the time I was too slow. And then I thought, oh, you know, they like 
beautiful, colorful flowers. There's this beautiful golf club near Camp Uch. So I was looking around the front entrance and they had these beautiful flowers. And I thought, I'm going to find one. And I was looking, couldn't find it, couldn't find it, looking up, looking. And then I walked a few steps and I looked down and there it was. There was my talk. I did collect it. What was there was a $50 bill. And so my story is we can be so busy looking for what we want that we miss what's here. And so I had to open my view to be able to see right in front of me was a $50 bill, which POGO, Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, quite readily took as a donation. Um, I figured it wasn't really mine, so I'd just pass it along. So that's what mindfulness is about in a word. But I'll tell you a little bit more um, and unfold it. Mindfulness, um, have people here taken a mindfulness course, by the way? I, a few people, yeah, 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 great. Um, mindfulness is the awareness that comes from paying attention on purpose, non-judgmentally, to the unfolding of a moment-to-moment -moment experience. A simpler way to say this is mindfulness is a fullness of attention to the present moment. I like to think about mindfulness in the way it was described in this paper by uh, Shapiro and Carlson about it's an awareness that has these three components or three qualities. It has intention. We purposely shift to say, I'm going to be aware, right? In some way or another. Sometimes it happens in a flash if we've really been practicing a lot. Sometimes we have to sort of set more of an intention like in the moment. It comes by paying attention to what's here. And it also, importantly, comes with a certain set of attitudinal foundations, including that we are trying as best as possible not so much to judge our experience as to um, uh, be curious about our experience, be interested, bring a kind curiosity. We don't have to like our experience, but our experience is often here. So showing up for it means that we can respond to it. So I'd like to do a few practices during the course of this talk. And this is a practice that I, that you can see my little logo for compassion, presence, and resilience training. This is something that um, healthcare providers found to be very, very useful um, in a study I did on this particular um, mindfulness intervention I created for healthcare providers. And um, when I created the course for them, typically in mindfulness courses, whether it's MBSR, or what I teach, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or mindful self-compassion, you give patients home practice to do. When I developed the course for healthcare providers, I gave them home practice, but I also gave them workplace practices, practices that they could adapt to use on the go in the moment. Um, and what we found in our study was most of them did not, unlike our patients, did not do their home practice. They're, you know. But what they did and what the study showed in our qualitative research was that they really gravitated to using the in the moment practices, the short practices. And this is one of them. And I share it a lot because I didn't create this practice, but I share it because I use this practice every single day. On my hospital keychain, I actually have a little happy face on the key to my door to my office so that every time I return to my office, I can do this practice. And why would I do that? By just stopping and take, inserting a pause and taking three to five slow, easy breaths, you shift from parasympathetic nervous, from sympathetic nervous system running on adrenaline, cortisol, 
to parasympathetic nervous system. And in that, you can create heart health. So you're asking about survivorship. There's lots of potential mechanisms, no proof whatsoever, but we can build heart health. So when you turn on the vagal nerve, you start to increase heart rate variability, which is a sign of heart health. And why would that be important? Because of all the medications you're getting, you know, you, wanna, you want the medications delivered to a body that is as healthy as can be, right? So I'm not making any promises whatsoever, but I'm thinking on the spot, and so I just added that to my presentation, responding to what you said. Um, anyway, let's try it here. Let's just, so this idea of stopping is about inserting a pause into your day. And Viktor Frankl, who wrote a book on logotherapy, anyone familiar with that book called Man's Search for Meaning? There weren't actually um, textbooks on psycho-oncology, the, the work I do when I started. And so I, I use books like Man's Search for Meaning as my base to learn about um, how people respond to extreme circumstances. And he wrote his, his book, that book in particular, um, in a concentration camp. And he said in that book, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. This notion of having choice, and that may be, you may want to sort of throw darts at me for saying that you have choice when you are going through something like multiple myeloma, but it is true, and it's, a, it's one of the places of empowerment. When we can put a pause, when we pause and, um, realize between sitting in the waiting room waiting for the doctor to come in to discuss our latest results, which you probably know about because you're using the portal now, but the implications of that potential treatment changes, between that stimulus of being in one of those exam rooms, I don't know what they're like at other hospitals, but they're not particularly pretty at Princess Margaret, and they're quite isolating, right? You can't see what's going on. You don't have a sense of when somebody's gonna open the door. If that's triggering between that and being able to have a clear, coherent discussion and ask the questions you need to hear, ask, it's much better if you can do it from a place where you've put a pause, you've done a quick exercise like this, so that you're ready to ask your questions, right? So let's just try it. Eyes open or closed. I like to close my eyes when I do these practices, but if I'm out and about, sometimes I don't. And just let's put an intentional pause, inviting you to take a few Slow, easy breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. No rush. Feeling the nourishment of the in-breath and perhaps a softening on the out-breath. And then simply observing how it is now. What kinds of thoughts do you have? What's happening in the body? What's the emotional state? It doesn't have to be different. It doesn't have to be positive. It's just showing up and noticing what's here. And then proceeding to perhaps in a little bit more connected way with a mindful presence to the next few moments of your day. Mindfulness can be just that simple, right? How is that for people? Possible to do? 
notice anything in doing it? You're relaxed. Relaxed. <coughs> Calming. Calming, yeah. It's less than one minute, right? We can find that in less than one minute. This is one of 12 practices in the Bright program I created for healthcare providers because they, we've created actually something that rolled out to all employees, not just healthcare providers, because no matter what function you do, um, at Princess Margaret, there's often stress uh, related to it. So um, all, all employees at Princess Margaret are now exposed to this program called Bright, and this is one of the practices. So another way to define mindfulness is, is what Susan Abbey, my boss, says. Mindfulness is fundamental because the present moment is the only time anyone has to perceive, learn, grow, or change, right? We have to be here. We have to show up so that we can um, uh, perceive, learn, grow, or change. Um, really, I just included this slide um, of three different meta-analyses on uh, mindfulness-based interventions. That's what MBI stands for. Um, uh, and what they showed with these pooled results is that it improves psychological distress. Um, in other words, reduces psychological distress. Uh, improves depression and anxiety, improves symptoms of insomnia, pain and fatigue, can reduce fear of cancer recurrence, um, and improve quality of life. Um, and this is particularly um, uh, relevant um, for the multiple myeloma um, group. I don't run separate groups for separate types of cancer. What's interesting about the groups we run at Princess Margaret is that um, we take people at any point in their cancer journey. So there's just like this group here today, right? It's not just for people newly diagnosed or people who are further along in the cancer journey who, are, who have a recurrence or who, who are closer to end of life. Everybody. Um, we have a whole mix in our, our groups. The only group we separate out, because we were asked to do this by a particular program, and that's how I came to, with Renat Neesom, study this area, um, we do offer separate groups for young adults with cancer as part of what's called the AYA program at the hospital. So what... Um, why we offer this is that we can improve the emotional well-being, emotional regulation, reduce perceived stress. And I want to emphasize, we don't take stress away. And sometimes people actually have more stressful life events happening through the course of the, the group. We've had you know, people who get bad news, or people who have economic hardship, or people who have job changes, or whatever. Uh, moves um, and uh, or coping with loss of of peers they've met along the cancer trajectory and 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 their reactions to that, um, but despite that, their perception of stress goes down through taking the mindfulness. Um, Obviously uh, important in terms of focus, present moment awareness, addressing existential issues, addressing side effects, and I highlighted three that are really important in this group here today. Fatigue, brain fog, and pain. I would say the other one that is super important, just to go back and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but emotional regulation. Dave mentioned um, when he filled out the survey, which I think is a great question, um, about being on dexamethasone, decadron, um, or other steroids, you know, the emotional dysregulation that, that is caused by that drug in a substantial por proportion of people who are on it. Um, and obviously fatigue and brain fog are, are important. 
We promote um, self-compassion, even though we're not specifically teaching self-compassion in um, the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. I, from time to time, offer mindfulness, mindful self-compassion, which is another eight-week program, um, uh, which I'm also trained in. We also, um, people find uh, and again, it's not something specific that we're teaching or addressing in the mindfulness program, but people have reported that they have an increased sense of continuity with their precancer self. I think we're opening up space for our full experience um, and an enhanced sense of empowerment. And we do this by teaching skills that focus, that teach focus, um, that uh, allow for us to see our full experience, that help us um, enhance concentration. So teaching about, uh, teaching focus practices. Um, we know, for example, memory issues, um, that divided attention, people who have divided attention are less like, have lower um, scores in memory testing, right? So if we can really show up and pay attention to one thing at a time, we enhance our possibility of, of remembering. Um, and of course, our society is going opposite of that, right? We've got our phones, we've got our our uh, computers and email and telephone and conversations. So it's very interesting. Um, we also work on um, uh, reducing reactivity. Uh, we work on decentering. So rather than saying, um, I am uh, a multiple myeloma patient, so I am kind of solidifies it. You know, I have multiple myeloma. I'm having a, uh, an experience with my health. It kind of gives it a little bit more distance. So really, decentering is about being able to see our experience rather, so that we can relate to our experience rather than from our experience. And I'll give you some quotes from patients that um, outline how that works. We help people learn techniques so they can reduce rumination. Rumination is when we're spinning with the same thought again and again and again. One, one thought that's very common amongst people who have a cancer experience is fear of recurrence. Um, I'm going to walk you through something called the three minute breathing space, quite similar to um, the um, stop exercise that we did. And I first, after doing training in mindful self-compassion, I wanted to dip a toe in. I wasn't ready to run a group yet. And so I was still doing more training and I was offering bits of the course. And I um, offered a patient um, who had had a number of recurrences of um, another kind of cancer um, the three minute breathing space. And she had previously done a lot of meditation but had trouble um, with her practice. And I'm like, you're, you're really an experienced meditator, so who am I to offer you this? But I'm just offering it in case it would be helpful. Can I guide you through a short practice? And at the end of it, I said, how was that? And she said, it was the first time in the last three years that I haven't wondered when is my cancer going to come back again. Because every time she got a remission, her cancer would come back. And so that became her focus. So she, she just in this three minutes recognized it didn't have to be her only focus. So that would be an example of how this manages to help with recurrence. It also um, helps us see the importance of connection. All of these, well, many of these techniques also map to resilience. So really, I've, I've done quite a bit of study on resilience in the last, like not studies, but study of. Um, 
resilience in the last uh, two years. Um, and um, mindfulness, self-awareness, uh, self-regulation, connection, um, optimism, and just fundamentally looking after ourselves are our six domains of resilience that we're now studying. Those, are, uh, those domains can be enhanced, and all of those track to this sort of mindfulness. So you're also building resilience. And um, the way I teach mindfulness most often to patient groups, we started offering patient groups in 2013 at Princess Margaret. And we've now, right now, we're just coming to the end of group series 39, 40, and 41. And we've never actually created a brochure or advertised. So this is the advertisement. If anybody's interested in taking the group, just have your doctor refer you. We'll be offering more groups in uh, the end of January and then again in the uh, springtime. But um, it's an eight-week program, and each week there's a different theme that gets unpacked, and there's practices both in terms of mindfulness-based um, meditation practices and cognitive practices to support our understanding and getting a taste of what this is all about. Um, and as I said, and then there's home practice as well. And so um, it's amazing what we see happening in just uh, a short period. Having reviewed the literature, these are the six components that impact well-being and are really central. And I'm going to show you from our study, I actually have quotes from our, our study, uh, our recent study on, uh, that was just published actually um, on MBCT for young adults. Um, previously we had done a study with um, the general population at Princess Margaret. Um, but the awareness, the decreased reactivity, the enhanced self-compassion, the decreased ruminations, the decentering and connection all came out in, uh, as being important to patients who were important themes in our qualitative research. In our quantitative research, so you know the actual scores, we had um, pre-post results in terms of decreased depression, decreased anxiety, decreased perceived stress, increased uh, self-compassion, and um, decreased uh, physical symptoms on the Edmonton uh, symptom scale. So I have this cartoon. I don't know if you can read it, but it says, I want to learn to live in the moment, just not this moment, some other moment, like a moment on the beach, right? I see people, it resonates. Uh, and so how, you know, why would people want to be in this present moment if there's pain or suffering? Well, there's some magic. Um, these are the themes that actually came out, the benefits of mindfulness um, that we found, you know, learning tools in the moment. Um, so, um, for example, um, a young person who had had to take a few years off university, um, we were able to guide them through a quick and easy way to sort of center before doing their first exam back at university, which they were quite petrified. We had one group actually that had three kids who were, I call them kids, they were 20-year-olds, 20, 20, 20 to 25-year-olds. Um, these kids who, you know, were re-entering school and doing exams and really scared, could they do it? Did they have it in them? So having these tools, finding an emotional center, coping with pain, um, acknowledging that one's feelings are vo uh, valid, those themes came out, as well as a sense of belonging, shared goals, sense of decreased isolation, um, and, a, and benefits of the group modality, 
more compassion for themselves and more continuity and sense of self. The challenges they found were that finding time to practice, staying focused, and reminders of past experiences and facing difficulties and unwanted thoughts. So they found that to be both a benefit and a challenge. And so we teach around that. Um, so one of the ways we teach this is um, that what our experience is when it's difficult, it's already here. So if we can become familiar with it, then we can do something about it, right? So well, mindfulness isn't supposed to strive towards a goal. It is really helpful in being able to sort of see what our different options are. But it starts by becoming familiar with our experience. It's OK. It's already here. I can be with this. Can I just get familiar with it, interested, and, and see it? And this is one place where we find it really to be helpful for pain. Because often people respond to pain as this solid entity. And um, you know, I'm just going to use a personal example. And, um, it, and it's minor compared to um, having the pain of, say, fractures from multiple myeloma. But I was away on a mindfulness teacher training that was called Awake in the Wild, so teaching mindfulness out in the wilderness. And the first night there, I had a flare of um, a disc injury I have in my thoracic spine, and I had that strong neuropathic pain. And I just catastrophized. I was like lying in this tent on this hard ground with just a thin mat, because I didn't want to carry too much stuff. So I started beating myself up for that. And thinking, oh my god, I'm going to have to be airlifted out. I'm going to, like, this is so bad. And, da, da, da. and then I'm like, hang on. You're a mindfulness teacher. Get a grip. Why are your toes clenched? Do you have pain in your back? Why are your hands clenched? Why is your butt clenched, right? So I started to just tune in to what was happening at other places in my body and releasing and bringing softness to those areas. And at the end of the day, the area of pain came down to one spot. Now that was, you know, that was where the disc was pressing on the, sp the, on the spinal column or the nerves, and it was painful. But I didn't have to have my whole body in pain of contraction. And then I could sort of start to say, OK, it's coming in these waves. What could I do? Maybe someone on this whole trip has some sort of medication I could get, you know, and really started to problem solve. So we hear that a lot, that people start to see that there's more layers to the pain than the solid entity. And mindfulness can help us sort through that. The key to mindfulness, however, is learning to stay, even when it's difficult. So this morning I was meditating, and all I could think about was this presentation. And I'm like, oh, come on, just come back. Come back. I just want to meditation and be with the breath. But no, this thought of talk about this, talk about that. So, but I had to stay through it. I had to get familiar with what was there. So this is a quote from some patients, um, from a patient in the study that said, sit there and focus on your breath and try to relax and try some Try to sort of calm yourself down, be aware of what you're feeling, focus on it from a neutral perspective so that you aren't being swayed by your emotions. So really demonstrating that when this patient showed up for what their experience was, they were trying to just parse it out so they weren't swayed, I love that, weren't so swayed by their emotions. Another patient commented, this, this comic says, I think I, put on, I might have put on too much concealer, and there's no head showing on this one body. And 
often people in these courses come to somebody likes that comment comic um, often people in these courses find a new appreciation for their bodies right we can we can really judge our bodies when they're not working optimally but there's a lot going right with our bodies even if you have multiple myeloma i mean john cabot zinn who um, I was fortunate enough to do some of my mindfulness-based stress reduction training with, um, says, as long as you're breathing, there's more right with you than wrong with you, you know? And I used to say, oh, how am I ever going to use that phrase? But patients really relate to that. And I use, I'm sorry, I have to just say, I use the word patient, not client, often with um, the MBCT, I'll say participant. But to me, patient is a really important word because patient comes from Latin and from pati, which is suffer, so one who suffers. And so as a mindfulness teacher, I like meeting you know, the suffering of others so that we can hold it together and, and see what happens with that. So that's, I'm just explaining why I use that term. Um, and I'm a doctor and I was trained in that. Um, so this person um, commented in our qualitative research, they said it wasn't just an emotional transformation, this awareness of body, of body scans, of occupying space was something that tied it all together, that it just made me feel contained and I have a very newfound appreciation for my body that I never really had before. So this is someone who participated in our um, qualitative research interview studies, where we went through all the studies and then came up with a thematic analysis. Um, anyone who's done a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program um, does what we call the backbone of the program, which is um, the three-minute breathing space. And the stop exercise is stop and put in a pause, take three to five breaths, observe your experience, and then proceed with mindfulness. This sort of flips it around where you start by noticing your experience and you can in the moment. So we have so many people who say, I was so triggered um, in the MRI machine and I just went into doing a body scan or I was triggered. So it's when you notice you're triggered or you build this skill so you have it available when you're triggered. Um, so this one starts by becoming aware of the experience, then gathering one's attention just to the breath, letting go of that experience and coming just to this breath and then widening the experience back out. So let's try that one. Um, and I should have said before, if you don't want to do these practices, that's fine. Just sit and fantasize about your whatever you want to fantasize about. Um, but if you want to give it a try, suggesting that you close your eyes, inviting you to notice what your experience is right now maybe you're getting a little hungry for those snacks maybe the body is feeling a little stiff just whatever you're noticing in the body thoughts and emotions and then gathering your attention to the breath so breathing in, you're aware you're breathing in, and breathing out, you're aware you're breathing out. If it's helpful, you can place a hand on your abdomen and just really feel the breath. The in-breath and the out-breath. And then widening your sense of attention out into the whole body so you feel a sense of the whole body sitting here breathing. Perhaps a sense of spaciousness or maybe you're noticing it's still a little contracted. So just bringing breath to the whole body, nourishing the body with your breath. 
And then opening your eyes. So that's another short practice we do in the course um, that becomes really an important practice and we develop that practice throughout the MBCT course as well as doing some longer practices. So we make space for all experience. This is a, um, a self-portrait that a young person with leukemia painted many years ago. Um, and I just find it so powerful to depict all the different facets of what you experience when you're going through a hematologic malignancy, right? And um, this is especially beautiful because the person um, felt that um, they would never paint again. And so I put out a little challenge to them and they did, they painted, they thought they would never be able to put on an art show, and they did. They raised over $100,000 for the hospital, and that was like 25 years ago, uh, 28 years ago, $100,000 then, imagine. So um, uh, really making space for the full experience, but also making space for joy. Um, so that, you know, like doing these exercises, yeah, I think that, I think our radiologists need to be looking for the funny bone a little bit more often, right? So when we teach, we want to, we want to make sure that we have that balance. And it's amazing how that helps people see that life can still be so full. And we help people um, reduce this reactivity so that they can be with anything. So this comic, I love these um, uh, comics uh, in psychiatrist offices, right? Sometimes even if I stand in the middle of the room, no one acknowledges me and it's a big elephant, right? So we don't have to tiptoe around elephants. We do a um, little exercise where we hold something that's heavy and you can try this at home. When you hold something that's heavy, I can barely hold that. I bring it in close where I can see it. I put another hand around it. I hold it with compassion, and I can be with this. The pushing away of negative experience takes a lot of energy. And I think that's why in these courses we're able to help people find energy is because they no longer have to dance around the elephant in the room. So we're, they, we really build the capacity to be with all experience, diminish avoidance, find the power of the pause, and learn to respond skillfully. So we step out of automatic pilot, where we, um, I mean, my automatic pilot is probably my husband leaving uh, just one minor example, you know, leaving the toilet paper roll with no toilet paper on it. And I'm like, how could you do? Okay, you're a mindfulness teacher, get a grip, stand back, is never gonna, ch you know, pick your battles. This one, you know, 28 years in is not likely to change. But we can see it, right? So we can respond more skillfully. Or if you're driving and someone cuts you off, right? It doesn't really help to get angry. It, it hurt, for us, it really creates contraction and it's not gonna change the other person. So those are just minor examples. We, we use many more health-related examples. People talk about finding their emotional center. It helps them find a sense of peace and calm in the midst of a storm, they're able to stay centered, just like this donut, right? Uh, find your center, well, one person did. So another comment someone made was, you know, can the world please stop spinning for a little bit so I can just get my bearings, that kind of thing. It brought me into a center that I didn't expect to find so quickly, an emotional center, but also a sense of, a grounding sense of being in time and space, right? We can get so worried 
and so anxious and so reactive that we, we lose our grounding. We lose time and space. And I'm going to just um, very quickly mention that people, and I'm not going to read this quote, but really just finding a way to treat themselves with kindness. We're not teaching the self-compassion practices per se, but we teach from a place of kindness. We teach from recognition that it's hard to be with things that are difficult, and it's hard to be th with things we don't like, but it doesn't mean we don't, don't like ourselves. So self-compassion we offer to ourselves, we're not offering it to the myeloma per se, we're offering it to ourselves to help us hold what's difficult. And this is this call and response. So for me, the real sweetness of mindfulness and teaching mindfulness at a cancer center is that we help people be in the present moment so they can recognize their experience and then respond to it. A Zen patriarch said it in a beautiful way, awareness is the foundation of kindness and kindness is the expression of awareness. But I just say it more simply, you know, it's recognition and response. And so we, when we get there, it's really quite beautiful. Um, and someone in this study said, you know, reducing the rumination, right? Going from future to past, to worry, to fretting, to what will happen. They said the main benefit uh, benefits have been reducing the grip of compulsive thinking, widening that sense of amplitude and joy in the mind, becoming able in small but hopeful manner to be less tyrannized by my self-censured doubt, regret, and sadness. I mean, that's powerful. Um, to me, anyway, in an eight-week program. So helping to contain our fears about recurrence, this decentering, so we don't have to, when we identify as being the problem, I am depressed rather than I'm feeling depressed in this moment, depression is here, um, very different. And so we don't wanna be feeding the monster, we wanna be seeing our experience fully so we can respond to it. It's like sitting on a riverbank and looking at our experience sort of floating downstream. Um, and then really um, people talking a lot about a sense of connectedness. So we teach mindfulness, it's not a support group. We support people coming to support groups like this where they can share and talk about um, what their experiences are and offer solutions to each other, learn, educate themselves, um, get involved in advocacy and giving back. Um, in our programs, people feel connected just by a shared experience, I think, but connection comes out as being very, very powerful, even though People know very, very little about each other. And I'm going to end with this slide. Um, this, it comes from, at the end, uh, week eight, um, we have people offer three words that the program represents to them, and this is a wordle from that. And these are the sorts of things people are saying, you know? finding joy and gratitude, focus, awareness, relaxing, you can see, very, very powerful. Again, I'm really stunned, and I think it's people's um, real sense of one, a sense of wanting to feel a sense of well-being, no matter what's happening in their experience of cancer, um, that, that people who take our programs seem to be very diligent in their practice. Even if they don't do their home practice, they seem to really benefit from um, these sorts of practices um, in the course. And then we really encourage people to do short practices so they are getting something out of, out of it. And so I'm going to end there. Um,
with my own offering of gratitude. Again, we don't, um, gratitude practice is not formally in the mindfulness program, but I can't help but teach it because it's just a part of, of what I understand about the literature on mindfulness and awareness and resilience. And um, do people have gratitude, pra formal gratitude practices? You know, it's been shown in the literature that if you either first thing in the morning or at some point in the day or before you go to bed, you just write three things you feel grateful for and you do that for a month, you can really shift your mood um, to having an enhanced sense of well-being. Pretty simple stuff, but it makes a big difference. And I think it really just, you, you do that practice? I do about 15 every day. Amazing, amazing. Uh, just started volunteering, I mean, and then it kept on coming and coming and coming and until I fall asleep <laughs> at night. Like, at least, uh, like, the, the first thing I do is, when I, when I leave the house, the first person whom I meet, in my mind, I say, okay, let this person have a wonderful day. Uh, it's an amazing feeling. Yeah. It's an amazing, like now, the scientists have found that if you, if you wish someone good health, you get it back. Mm -hmm. If you wish someone good health, mm -hmm. you get it back. I, I'm not wishing them something, in expecting something, but genuinely I offer, okay, let this person when I go to the hospitals, I just have a blanket blessing. May all these people be getting the right treatment, get the right doctors. Amazing feeling. <laughs> yeah, and it really does. So, so that is something that we really focus on more specifically, and that exercises a little piece of the loving kindness meditation, which if anybody's interested in the Huffington Post, I think in 2014, um, a very prominent psychologist collected um, 18 scientific reasons for doing that practice. And it's really amazing from reducing inflammatory response to helping with pain and sleep and it's really nice. So she summarized it and then has links to the different articles. Yeah, and so it is a beautiful practice that, that really flourishes. As you say, you know, you might start with three and then it just keeps coming and growing, right? You're planting seeds and seeing what emerges. So thank you. No, I'm just going back to one of the presentations you had there. Um, one that came up was brain fog. Yes. Right? Uh, I'm not sure if he has it. Well, he's got the multiple myeloma. And I've had problems with him forgetting. Right. Now, I think he has selective um, <laughs> uh, listening or remembering what he wants to, rather than when I refer to something, he said, well, you know, the doctor said it's the medication. So would medication have an effect on the, that brain fog as you brought up there? So brain fog is probably multifactorial, yes. So medication can have an effect, various medications can have effect, um, chemotherapy, um, stem cell transplant, radiation, and even surgery. So the fact that, um, patients who have cancer um, who only have surgery, not speaking to the multiple myeloma um, patient population, um, but just by way of, of underscoring this, the fact that um, uh, people who have surgery for cancer um, can sometimes suffer from brain fog as well, um, means that it's probably somehow um, part of an immune pathway, right? The body's response to surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, in part. There are some chemotherapies that directly impact the brain because they 
cross the blood-brain barrier, but most chemotherapies aren't, that's not the mechanism of brain fog. So, so it's probably got something to do with an immune pathway. So the woman in the back is asking um, if in this mindfulness course, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, um, we teach the window of tolerance. So I'm going to say that you took a course with Rachel Frankfurt at St. Mike's. No, actually, no, I didn't. It's my brain fog. Okay, so most people don't teach the window of tolerance. Um, however, because I'm also trained in trauma work, I do. Um, we insert it as um, in most um, classes I teach, depending on how full the curriculum is. And if I don't teach it in the MBCT, which is quite a prescribed course, and each week there's a theme that gets unpacked very specifically. There's a couple of places I can insert the window of tolerance. Uh, if I don't teach it there, I teach it in our graduate program. So after somebody takes a course with me, I offer like drop-in classes once a month where I can sort of be free to teach anything um, that I think is called for or not taught in the other classes. The window of tolerance is um, from, I guess it's really Dan Siegel is the person who talks about it and writes about it the most. And it's this notion that each of us um, has a certain window and the amount the windows open varies. If we've had a lot of trauma, sometimes there's a very narrow opening and our job is to try and open the window a little bit. If we open, when we're not in our window of tolerance, we're either outside of it above the window, which is in fight, flight, freeze mode. And if we're under it, we're in fold mode. So the idea in trauma um, and we were talking about it, actually, your question is a great question um, for two reasons. One, we were talking about Claire Payne a few minutes ago, and Dr. Claire Payne um, is an expert in trauma, one of the people who I took some trauma training from. Um, but also, people were saying that sometimes having a multiple myeloma experience can be tra traumatic, almost like having PTSD. Some people may actually develop full-out symptoms of PTSD depending on how they presented with multiple myeloma, but that would be a significant minority of people. But people can have small t trauma, and the window of tolerance fits with that, with big t trauma and with little t trauma. So this notion, I don't have a slide here that shows it, but the idea is we need to do things to get back in this window, the part that's open, where we can function. Um, and we function um, in our window. We can get back into the window if we've left the window through either using mindfulness techniques or through using other forms of resourcing, which might even be calling a friend, you know, going for a walk. It's things that take us out of that place of being really triggered, um, take us away from fight, flight, freeze, and coming back into the window, or taking us back from folding, right? And um, uh, what was I going to say about? So when we're in the window, um, it's when we're operating optimally, right, comfortably. And the idea is that um, Dan Siegel talks about the handy brain. And there's a beautiful YouTube video about the handy brain, and he'll describe it much better than I'm going to, but this is my version. 
if, if my arm is the brain stem, or sorry, the, yeah, the brain stem, the spinal cord rather, and then my palm here is the brain stem, and then here is the emotional center in the amygdala, and when the fist, or sorry, here is the emotional center in the amygdala, the thumb, and when the, my hand is closed, this is the prefrontal cortex. In the prefrontal cortex, that's the part of the brain that, that serves executive functioning. Things like logic, reason, problem solving, ability to use insight, ability to use meditation. Meditation helps build the prefrontal cortex. Um, and so when we're triggered, we can get very reactive and flip our lid. So we're operating from the brainstem right here in the palm. And when we're in the brainstem, it's primitive. It's about survival. Fight, flight, freeze. Just think about hearing the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. You might remember feeling that fight, flight, freeze, or even lying on your back and folding, like just resigning um, to it. Right? So our job is to bring this prefrontal cortex back online. And so what mindfulness courses like MBCT, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and even mindful self-compassion to some extent, what those things do is allow us to learn techniques that help us bring this back online much faster and keep us in our window. Yeah. Um, so I'm being asked, what is the blood-brain barrier? So I, the, the easiest way to describe that is that, that the body is really so wise. The way that our bodies are created is miraculous. And our brain is protected. And a lot of substances can't get into the brain. They have to have certain molecular composition to be able to get through the protective barrier that's created. And so where it comes up in terms of treatments for cancer sometimes, the best way to demonstrate that is brain cancer. The, the trick in trying to treat brain cancer is you need medications that can get through, that are the right molecular constitution to get through that protective barrier. So the brain is, is created in such a way that um, to prevent it from toxicities, right? They don't want just any substances getting mm -hmm. in. So that's sort of my okay, quick description of that. Yeah. yeah. The question has to do, and tell me if I'm getting this right, um, with the ethics of mindfulness. Yes. So, um, which I'm going to answer that in two ways, because you also spoke about um, uh, how mindfulness is being used. So there's a fantastic paper, I think just published in around 2018, called Be Mindful of Mindfulness Interventions which is talking about some of this issue, and it's talking as well about how um, some of the claims about mindfulness are difficult to really study, and the meta-analyses aren't showing the, the treatments to be quite as robust as um, some of the claims. The reason I decided to bring mindfulness-based cognitive therapy to our hospital is because its particular kind of mindfulness that f was developed by three preeminent psychologists who studied this in a randomized control trial, manualized it, revised it, refined it for probably 10 years before they brought it to the public and have continued to, the first book they published on it was 2002. Um, a new version of the book came out in maybe 2010, 11, something like that. Um, but uh, hundreds of papers 
deconstructing this particular kind of mindfulness and really putting it to a whole variety of um, tests in the research, including fMRI studies and um, psychological studies and trials against antidepressants and with antidepressants and really, really rigorously studied. And I met with Zindel Siegel before we brought the treatment to Princess Margaret. He was the person who trained me in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, but I, we asked him about using it. And he said, just cover up for you know um, people with depression and use cancer-related distress. So I, what I'm saying is I picked something that I felt was um, well studied and a therapeutic intervention, not something that you could get on the street corner um, per se, although some people will offer mindfulness outside of those therapeutic invention, interventions do an amazing job. Um, so that's in, in Be Mindful of Mindfulness Interventions, this article, this, this journal article talks about how a lot of the treatments aren't manualized, they're not, we're not looking at um, how well trained um, the people giving the interventions are, we're not looking at the fidelity of how they're teaching the interventions, um, and that sort of thing, and that's all very true. There's another part to teaching mindfulness, which is in order to do teacher training in mindfulness, you have to have your own mindfulness practice. You also have to have done a minimum of seven days silent retreat time before you can get into um, teaching mindful uh, to a teacher training program. And then you're supposed to do annual silent retreats yourself. Not everybody does that, but it's an aim for sure. There's no body that's saying, you know, making you say what you've done every year. But in general, that's what's supposed to happen. That's really where the ethics of mindfulness gets taught, which kind of comes out of the Buddhist roots. And even though I'm not Buddhist, and I teach a very secular form of mindfulness, I have great respect that it should be taught with the ethics. And really, in the definitions of mindfulness, it comes with a big dose of the ethics behind it. But that's not, in general, how it's taught. So um, I have to say I agree <laughs> um, that there's a lot of variability. And so I f that's really why I teach the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, because it brings both of those, for me, has been able to bring both of those things together. Yeah, so good question. So the question is, how can I get into a mindfulness-based uh, course? So the ones we offer at Princess Margaret um, are held on the 18th floor at Princess Margaret. I, um, and the next one, the orientation. So we offer an orientation so that people can get a taste of it and know what they're signing up for, because as best as possible, we ask people to commit to the whole eight-week program recognizing that things come up and also recognizing that we have a very strict policy about um, not coming to class if you have a cold or the flu or an infectious diarrhea, different than a lot of courses, right? We are very strict about that. I've, I, I actually try and keep myself as healthy as possible, so I live by that rule too. Um, but I've literally sent home co-therapists who have come in coughing. I'm like, we can't, we can't have you here, right? So right now I relapsed. Yeah. I relapsed, so I just simply protect myself. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. So we we do hold that as a strict rule. So yes, at Princess Margaret, um, the next, so we, the, so I'm just saying we do try and get people to come to an orientation and then commit to the eight week program. And um, the next one is, I think the next orientation is the third week in January. Uh, 
your doctor can just um, send a referral and it just has to say for MBCT, anyone who's at Princess Margaret, um, the doctors know there's a, there's a referral on the forms section of the internet. They'll know what I mean. So they, there's an official referral form, but we also just take a note from the doctor saying, you know, could this person take MBCT? And sometimes we send back the referral form for them to fill out properly. There's then an intake, so we get patients to do their own uh, paperwork because we don't inf interview every single person who comes into the course. We do screen, um, so people fill out an intake form and we screen. If someone is profoundly depressed, we, we offer that they get treatment for the depression and, and then take the course at another point in time. If somebody, we were talking about this at break, if somebody has post-traumatic stress disorder, we need to know about it. We do interview those people because we offer some specialized um, techniques that allow them to be in the course. Um, so um, as best as possible, we try to accommodate everybody. And really the only other absolute um, problem and reason why we exclude people is if there's a really active substance abuse happening, you can't benefit from mindfulness until you get treatment for substance abuse. I'm not saying anybody here is in that category, but um, you know, so there's very few exclusion criteria, but we do, um, that's kind of the process is people fill out an intake, we read the intake, and then I might have a brief conversation with them by phone. So, being that you're experienced as a doctor, how would you define, how would we know as lay, lay people um, by the post-traumatic stress? Oh, so you, you would know, um, uh, because usually people with post-traumatic stress have a combination of symptoms. So the question about what is post-traumatic stress, not saying that people in the room have this, although I was asked a question about it um, at the break um, and where to get help for that, so uh, that's why I raised it. But it's not very common. Um, and, and really, if you had it, you probably would be seeking out treatment. Nightmares, flooding, uh, anxiety symptoms, uh, avoidance, dissociation, a whole lot of different uh, symptoms, yeah. Um, are you aware of any, any science or any evidence um, <clears throat> that would show that mindfulness um, may be helpful in knocking down myeloma? We, we, from what you described, it, it improves quality of life, but does, is there any evidence that it sh um, actually helps attack the cancer? So I know of no evidence um, that it attacks the cancer. However, it makes one think that you could put in a grant to look at some of the immune factors, um, or you could piggyback on to someone's um, treatment protocol and add mindfulness and see, you know, if that part of the treatment arm did any better than the other parts. But no, I don't know of anybody who's studied that. I think some people are starting to need to leave, so I'm not sure how long we should go, but yes. Yeah, so double isolation, we had a question. So the question is, I mentioned double isolation. Uh, and I, someone at the break also asked me about that. Double isolation is when you not only feel isolated by having a diagnosis like cancer, different than your peer group, who doesn't have the diagnosis. You have the double whammy, um, because I was presenting some of the research from our young adults group. They have the double whammy of sitting in the waiting room, looking around and not seeing people who look like them because you know they're sort of in the 20 to 35 age gr group. Um, and with those people, um, they find it very helpful to have a group intervention 
like this um, to break down both kinds of isolation. So in most of our groups, people find it breaks down the isolation of just having multiple myeloma. It, um, and young people do are on the curve of still getting multiple myeloma. So, yeah. So I think um, I would just like to offer, once again, my gratitude um, to you for your interest, for listening, and um, for your commitment to this support group and to helping the cause of, of multiple myeloma, because I do know that many of you here are instrumental in raising awareness, advocacy, and even fundraising. So thank you for all, from all the staff at um, Princess Margaret. I know your work is really so appreciated. Thank you.